church. Isn't it great to see every Sunday the, the number of young people that we have going over to their time of worship and uh, even the little ones down in junior church. The preschool aisle is full over here to my left in, in each room, and I thank God that uh, parents are bringing their, their young people to church with them. So uh, that's always good to see every Sunday. As Alex mentioned, we are beyond excited about this 3C journey we're about to embark upon. Our theme this year is one. We've been looking at our one Savior these first few weeks of the, the new year. And then we're going to go into a, a new part in our study of the Gospel of John, into the one who is. And we're going to be looking over the next few weeks Bible characters that Jesus interacted with uh, one who was searching, one who was hungry, one who was grieving, one who was wounded. And there's going to be six all together leading up to a special day that we're going to have in April. But as Alex said, our own people are involved in this 3C journey, this, this small group journey. And we're having six different people from our congregation give a personal testimony each week by way of video in our group. So you want to sign up for that group. Do it on the back of the bulletin. Do it in the foyer this morning. Uh, different groups for different days. And you just pick the day that's going to be best for you. We complete our journey, though, today on our one Savior in John chapter 1. So if you want to turn open your Bible to that passage of Scripture, the fourth book of the New Testament, John chapter 1. While you're turning over there, let me just sort of do a quick survey here with you this morning. How many of you parents, when you were getting ready to have your first child, either bought a book about baby names, did an internet search about baby names, or got into a fight or discussion with your spouse about what the name of your firstborn was going to be? Well, not very many of you raising your hands. Some of you have the courage, men, to raise your hand on that one, and I appreciate that. Most of you are cowards, right? So two, two of the most often asked names, or I'm sorry, two of the most often asked questions of an expectant mother is, first of all, what are you going to have, a boy or girl? Secondly is, names have you thought about? Have you thought about any names yet? And we spend hours and days searching and digging and exploring that perfect name. Maybe you have a unique name. Maybe your parents spent hours looking for just the right name. Maybe it took seconds. I don't know. They look and say, well, this looks like a Herman, so we'll just call him that. I, I don't know. Maybe it's a family name handed down through years. Just do me a favor this morning. On the count of three, I just want everybody to say their name, right? Say your name. One, two, three, Oh, that was pathetic. That really was. But there was a variety of names here in this congregation this morning, and probably there's not too many of us have similar names with, with one another. Uh, most part, they're, they're all different. Now, we do that on purpose. We want that child's name to stand out. And so, you know, celebrities like Scarlett Johansson named their child Cosmo. I wonder if the grandfather's Kramer you're not a Seinfeld fan, you don't get that one. Uh, Alicia Keys had two sons, uh, Egypt and Genesis. No word on the exodus of their third. Uh, Katie Holmes, Katie Holmes gave, I, I, I tell you, I'm going in the wrong direction already this morning, uh, but I'm going to go deeper, all right? Katie Holmes gave her daughter the name Surrey, which begs the question, what kind of problems does that create if Surrey has a Siri? I don't know. Kanye West evidently didn't ask for any directions when it came to naming his daughter. He gave his daughter the name North, North West. True story. I did a little looking into names this week and discovered that the number one most popular boy's name from this past year, 2022, was Liam, L-I-A-M. Uh, number two was Noah. Interestingly enough, in the top 10, there were three Bible names. That's, that's really interesting. Number 328 on the list of most popular names last year was the name Mark. The name Mark. I read a true story one time about a couple whose little girl's name was Famali. And someone asked them how they chose such an unusual name. And the mother said, well, we didn't name her. The nurses at the hospital did. When they brought her to me the first time, her name was on her little wristband, Famali Jones. And we decided when we liked the name and we kept it. And the person said, well, how do you spell Famali? And she said, just like it sounds, F-E-M-A-L-E, -E, Famali. Oh, it's a rough, rough crowd this morning, right? <laughs> Spelling is a requirement here. Most of the time, though, we put more effort into a baby's name, right? Because we live with the assumption that names matter. So parents will agonize for weeks about the name to give their children. 
Some people even go to the courtroom, you've heard of that, to get their name changed because we know names have a powerful influence and names can make a statement. That's why some believers choose names that are from the Bible. I have a son named Aaron. I have a nephew that's named Isaac. I have a great nephew named Abraham. I know someone that not too long ago discovered that Nimrod was in the Bible. That made them feel better because they've been hollering at their kids while they're grand. What are you, a Nimrod or something here? So names make a difference, don't they? Names can stand for reputation. He makes a great name for himself. Names can stand for character or lack thereof. He's a Benedict Arnold. Names can stand for authority, stop in the name of the law. Now, if that's true about names today, it's even truer in biblical times, especially when God did the naming. So, as I said, we're in this last segment today of this series, Hello, My Name Is, and what we've been going, doing is going through the Gospel of John, chapter 1, looking at some of the names associated with Jesus. He's the Word. He is the light and life. He is Creator. He's Messiah. He's Lamb of God. But as we've said, those are more like titles. We can add more from our text this morning. Verse 49, if you look at it, he's called the King of Israel. He's called the Son of God. Verse 50, he's called the Son of Man. That's a whole sermon in and of itself. That title goes back into the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. In reality though there's only one name here's the thing mary and joseph didn't get to name their own son god the father named their son for them remember in matthew chapter 1 and verse 21 it simply says give birth to a son you're to give him the name jesus the angel told them because he'll save the people from their sins call him jesus now in a sense that's his only name all the others messiah lamb of god uh the Christ, those are titles, but he's got one name. The name is Father, his Father in heaven, picked for him. And in our text in John chapter 1, when Philip starts following Christ, he finds his friend Nathaniel. And if you look in our text again in verse 45 and verse 46, here's what happens. Philip found Nathaniel and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, about whom the prophets also wrote. In other words, all the Old Testament was pointing to this one right here. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. And Philip said, come and see. Jesus of Nazareth. We'll see in a minute why he specified Nazareth. Jesus, though, that's the name. The name appears 13 times here in the first chapter of the Gospel of John, 909 times in the New Testament. 909 it's as if the Bible writers were in unison declaring, boy, there's something about that name. And I guess the Father did too. So let's take some time this morning and ask, why that name, the name Jesus? And there's some good reasons why God chose that name. First of all, Jesus is an explained name. You know what it means? We just read it there from Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21. The angel said, call him Jesus, for he will save the people from their sins. It's explained. And actually the word Jesus means this. It means the Lord saves. That's what it means. A savior. Think of how we use that word. You saved me. Oh man, you saved me from an embarrassing moment. You saved me from an awkward situation. But when the Bible talks about being saved, it speaks in terms of being saved from our sins, from being eternally separated from God. In fact, Romans chapter 5 and verse 9 puts it like this. We've now been justified, made right with God through Jesus Christ by his blood. How much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? A holy God brings his wrath upon sin in Christ taking the punishment for us at the cross were saved through him so God chose the name because of the mission notice God didn't say and he'll save people from their enemies <laughs> now we'd love that wouldn't we if he did that everybody would make him king he didn't say God will uh, Jesus will save people from other people's sins boy that would be great to be saved from other people's sins right but that's not why he came he came to save me from my sin he came to save you from your sin that's why he came that's why he became flesh. That's why he assumed a body. That's why the night he is born, the shepherds are told in Luke chapter 2 and verse 11, unto you this day a Savior is born. Every time Mary called him by that name, she was saying, the Lord saves. And that name says it all. He wasn't born to be a therapist. He wasn't born to be a social activist. He wasn't born to be a moral ethicist, even though he can deal with all those things. He was born to be a Savior. I, I just don't need improving, I need saving. I don't need just a little fine-tuning to get right with God. I need a new beginning. If I'm okay and you're okay, then why the name? Jesus. We don't just need repairing, we need redeeming. 
In fact, the Bible says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 9 and 10, these words, this is how God has showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice for our sins. A sacrifice for our sins. Now, I've got one of these cards in my pocket today. You know, this card is probably one of the most practical items ever invented. It's plastic, but it's not a credit card. There's no fees associated with it. There's no interest charged to it. It's a gift card. And approximately 75% of us purchased at least one of these just a couple of months ago at Christmas time to give to a friend or a family member, whatever it was. It has a dollar amount on it. It has a value that someone's paid on your behalf. Gift cards are a big industry. Approximately $130 billion are spent each year on gift cards. Think about that. The only thing about them is that their value can only be unlocked, though, when they're used. The challenge is to make sure you don't fall into the $21 billion crowd. You know what that is? Nearly half of Americans are holding on to $21 billion in unused gift cards. That averages out, if you take the whole population, that averages out to $175 a person. Now, the point is this. It's a gift. But it's worthless unless it's taken, unless it's used, unless it's applied. And John chapter 3, verse 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. He gave him to have everlasting life. The price has already been paid on your behalf. It's a gift, but it personally has to be accepted. It has to be applied into our life. And here's the thing. We've got to get real about this. Just coming to church alone, without personally accepting Jesus as your Savior, is like having a gift card to the one place you've always wanted to go, having loaded onto it an unlimited amount that will never expire or run out, but never, ever using it. Revelation chapter 22, verse 17 says, Let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes take the free gift of the water of life. Take it. The gift's already been offered and paid for. The value is priceless, eternity but you've got to personally receive it, accept it, and apply it. The Lord saves. You ever thought about this? The essence of sin is man trying to substitute himself for God. In the Garden of Eden, you'll be like God. It's man trying to make himself his own God. Man substituting himself for God, but the essence of salvation is God substituting himself for man, a Savior, Christ the Lord. Now, in our text, something interesting is taking place. In the passage of Scripture right before the one that Alex read this morning, you'll notice that Andrew finds someone named Simon, who we will later know as Peter, and he brings him to Jesus, finds him and brings him to Jesus. And then in our text, Philip found a fellow by the name of Nathaniel, and he brings him to Jesus. I just want to ask, who do you need to find? Who do you need? Who do you know who needs to know Jesus saves? An explain name. He'll save the people from their sins. It's also this. It's an easy name, isn't it? It's an easy name. Jesus. Do you know there's a guy in the Bible named Tiglath Pileser Adonai Bezek? Can you imagine if God named him that? That certainly wouldn't have worked with the morning music we had today. Tiglath Pileser Adonai Bezek. Just that name. I mean, half of us would be butchering it. And other half sound like they're speaking in tongues or something. But the name Jesus. A child can learn. Five, syllable, uh, five letters, two syllables. Except with a TV evangelist, then it becomes three syllables. Jesus, right? But most of the time, it's just two. An easy name. It's so easy that it's pronounced almost the same way in pretty much any language. I mean, you can travel the world and listen to people talk in their native tongue and not know what they're saying until they say the name Jesus. Oh, Jesus. I know him. If you ever taught Sunday school to little children, you know, early in life, even small children can easily answer that name of our Savior. Maybe you ask who healed the sick? Jesus. Who fed the 5,000 with the loaves and fish? Jesus. Who loved you so much that he died for you on the cross? Jesus. Even my three-year-old grandson can say, Jesus. Such an easy name. I tell you what else it is. Jesus is an everyday name. Jesus is an everyday name. For example, there's thousands upon thousands of Jim Smiths in America. It's a, it's a good name, but it's a very common name. And I understand that there's a Jim Smith Club in America with over 50,000 people registered in it. 
50,000 people in the Jim Smith Club. Every year, they meet out in Las Vegas, and one of the highlights of the Jim Smith Convention is a softball game in which everyone participating is named Jim Smith. Even the umpires named Jim Smith. They get a big kick out of announcing each batter by saying, and now coming to the plate is Jim Smith. And of course, every batter's Jim Smith, every fielder's Jim Smith, as I said, every umpire's Jim Smith. Can you imagine the announcer calling a double play? Smith hits it to Smith at first, over to Smith for one, back to Smith for two. No, Smith beats it out. The throw, Sp- Smith calls him out, and Smith is furious. And running out of the dugout, Smith gets in Smith's face to argue the call that Smith made. And then, of course, Smith gets thrown out of the game. In the first century, the name Jesus was like Smith. It was a very common name in Palestine. When he was born, The name of Jesus was as common as Tom is today or Brad or Jim Smith. That's why, as I said in the text, did you notice when Philip identified him, he said, Jesus of Nazareth. There were so many Jesuses back then. It was a name you would expect to find in any classroom. That's because first century Jews liked their name there kids after Old Testament heroes. And who's one of the heroes in the Old Testament? A man by the name of Joshua. Jesus is the Greek form of that Old Testament name, Joshua. Same thing. And Joshua was the name of one of the greatest heroes of the Old Testament. So there's a lot of boys running around in Palestine with the name Jesus. It's an everyday name for any boy back then. There's nothing unusual about it. If there was a crowd of thousands like the day he fed them with loaves and fish and you called out Jesus, 50 men would have probably stood up and said, yeah. Just like if you went into some holler in Kentucky and yelled out Jim Bob, you know, 10 brothers and cousins and a funeral director would have jumped up. You know, that's the kind of name it was. In fact, did you know that Jesus was not only, well, he was not the only Jesus in the New Testament. There were others. In Acts chapter 13, I think it is, there's a guy named Bar Jesus. Colossians chapter 4 verse 11, Jesus who is called Justice. And I think if my parents in the first century would have called me Jesus, I'd have been changing my name too, just like that guy did. An everyday name, the name of Jesus. Now all that changed. By the second century, you don't see the name of Jesus hardly anymore. That's because it became so sacred to the Christians that nobody wanted to call their name Jesus. And it became so hated by the Jews that they would no longer call their boys Jesus either. So within a few short years, a name that was very common became uncommon. A name that was ordinary became extraordinary because of the one who wore it. But it was, at that time, a common name. You say, so what? Well, just think. Yes, there's a side of Jesus that's unlike us. Emmanuel, God with us. Divinity, deity, God in human form. There's a side of Jesus that's not like us, but there's a side of Jesus that's just like us. Not only divinity, he's humanity. Just Jesus, like you and me. Have you ever been poor? Jesus most often didn't have a bed, let alone a home. (laughs) <laughs> ever feel as if just needed to get away? Often early in the morning, Jesus would get away by himself and just pray. He just needed to get away sometimes. Ever experienced family tension? When Jesus' family heard what he was doing, they tried to come down and take him away. He's out of his mind. He's, he's gone crazy. Ever been falsely accused or lied about? Boy, listen to the lies they tell about him right before he's crucified. Ever lost someone close to you? Jesus weeps when he loses his dear friend Lazarus, and he grieves when his cousin John's murdered. Ever had a friend let you down? The 12 flee Jesus at the most crucial time of his life, right before he is being put onto the cross. They come back, but for a while they flee. Here's what the Bible says about him. You know, we talked a few weeks ago about a high priest who would represent the people before God in the Old Testament. And he says, Jesus is the ultimate, the great high priest. He represents us before our Father in heaven once and for all. He's gone into heaven. Let us hold on to the faith that we have. For our high priest is able to understand, get this, our weaknesses. He's tempted in every way that we are, yet without sin, an ordinary common name, An everyday name you'd hear a dozen times reminding us that Jesus came for ordinary common people like you and me. That's so foreign to our world. If we have a message we want to get out, how does Hollywood do it? You know, Hollywood advertises with with the most glossy, flashy, professional way. Any product that's advertised on TV, the spokesperson has to have class and authority and perfect hair and white teeth and a flashy smile and an attractive appearance. So, So Jennifer Garner is the face of Capital One. And Taylor Swift endorses Diet Coke. 
And Harry Styles sells Gucci. But who does God use to be his spokesman? Remember? Some stinky shepherds in a field? Really? They could never go to the temple or make sacrifices and feasts. They couldn't abandon their flock. Some of them were thought to be crooks and thieves. People really didn't want to be around them. They were considered of such low character that couldn't even testify in court. When the first people read the account of Jesus' birth from Luke, it's got to be a shock. Nobody ever showed up to hang out with the shepherds. The group you would have thought would have been the first group to hear about the good news of the Messiah coming to the earth. The last group you would have thought that would have been would have been the shepherds. If you've ever wondered if you were important enough for God to notice, if God could ever do anything with your life, with all of its problems and all of its mess-ups and all of its foul-ups, it's not to the heads of state or to the kings and queens, but to a lowly group of itinerant shepherds that the announcement comes in Luke chapter 2. I bring you good news of great joy. Today is born to you a Savior, a Savior, Jesus. Jesus is an exalted name. It's an exalted name. <laughs> I was reading this past week about a wife or her and her husband come back into the house. He hadn't been gone very long. He came right back. And she said, honey, I thought you were going to your lodge meeting. I was. It was postponed. Why? Well, you know Harry, our grand, exalted, invincible, supreme potentate. Yeah. Well, his wife wouldn't let him go. <laughs> it's important to remember who holds the authority, right? Establishing authority is critical. And I don't know about you, but I believe whoever can stand over his own grave and have a final word over death has the authority to have the final say over my life. So the first thing to do is to determine who is first. The world says it has certain authority. There's only one who holds the authority. And all Scripture shouts his name. In fact, over in the book of Philippians in chapter 2, here's what it says. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, speaking about Jesus. Therefore God exalted him and gave him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. Over the centuries, many men have tried to become God, but only once did God become man. See, our story starts, get this, our story starts with a God who enters a virgin womb and ends with a God who leaves an empty tomb. The one born into our life stands over his own death. And so that same passage of Scripture goes on to say, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. And one day, that's going to take place. One day, every knee is going to bow at the name. Joe Biden's knee's going to bow. Satan worshiper Sam Smith's knee's going to bow. Joe Burrow's knee's going to bow. Vladimir Putin's knee's going to bow. Your knee's going to bow. My knee's going to bow. Jesus is the only name in the end that will stand alone. The name above every name. Even a godless world acknowledges that in a very weird way. A guy who's not a Christian hits his finger with a hammer and he's not going to say, oh, Buddha, or oh, Abraham, or oh, Muhammad, or oh, Pope. Often he's going to say GD or JC, the name of Jesus. Now, you know, that, that, that grieves me that, that they're going to use Christ's name in such a profane way. But that in itself is evidence that there's something different about the name. Why else would the devil try to tear that name alone down. His name's an exalted name. So here's the thing. He's not first among equals. He's first, and there are no equals. Recently, I played a game of three-person chess. You ever played that? Three-person chess. It's a real thing. It was wild. Not one opponent, but two opponents. Rules were a little different. You could only go in a certain direction. It was challenging. It was confusing. It was really difficult. You'd move towards one opponent, and then you'd leave yourself open to the other opponent attacking you. But still, with all the differences from regular game of chess, the object of the game remained the same. The ultimate goal was to capture the other person's king without, while protecting your own. You know, some, maybe a novice goes into chess, and they'll get a bunch of pawns or whatever it is, and they'll have all these pieces over here, and they leave their king unprotected, and they have all these pieces, but still, if the other person comes in, slips in, and captures your king, the game is over. Your spiritual opponent in battle, the devil, wants you to go through life with that same approach. Here's his strategy. 
to get you focused on stuff that doesn't really matter. Accumulating stuff and pieces and how you want to get ahead and winning and the idea of the world's success so that you take your focus off the one king. But here's the thing, it doesn't matter in the end how much you accumulate, hold, hoard, acquire. If you lose your focus and lose sight of King Jesus, you've lost it all. In the end, the king stands alone. In life, the first thing is to determine who is first, who's going to be king. In other words, establishing authority in your life is your first priority. Remember Luke chapter 2 again? We've heard it so many times. A Savior's been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. A Savior, Lord. A Savior, Lord. You can't accept Jesus by cutting him in half. He's not an item on the buffet of life. I'll take the Savior part. I'll take the forgiveness of sins, the peace of mind, the heaven and Savior part. But, you know, hold on to the Lord stuff, God. (laughs) This thing's not really going to affect my life in too much of a way here. Here's a newsflash. Jesus doesn't leave that option open to us. If he's your Savior, then he's going to be your Lord. We can't say, I've taken part of the Savior part and the promise of heaven. Now, Jesus, I'll take care of everything else until you take me home someday. The name Jesus asks us to slow down down and to ponder the wonder. The one in the cradle is the one who wears the crown. And you can't half-heartedly, with mediocrity, honor majesty. Here's a fifth reason. Jesus is an exclusive name. Speaking to the people in Acts chapter 4 who had put Jesus on the cross, Peter, for once, once and for all, is bold and he has his courage. And he says, he quotes an Old Testament scripture, and he says, this stone you builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. And he's talking about how Jesus fulfilled it. He's the cornerstone, the foundational piece for every person, every life, everything. And then he goes on to say there's salvation and no one else. God's given him no other name, no other name under heaven by which we can be saved. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father by me. Here's the unique difference between Jesus and every other world religious leader. Other religious leaders say, follow me, and I'll show you the way to salvation. Jesus said, I am the way. Others say, follow me, and I'll show you how to find the truth. Jesus says, I am the truth. Follow me, and I'll show you how you can live a meaningful life. Jesus says, I am the life. When you knock on the door of heaven, there's only one name that's going to get you in. And we should never be ashamed or never afraid to say what the Bible says about that name. It's the exclusive name given to us to save us. There is salvation in no other name, the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus means the Lord saves. And let me say this, Jesus will always live up to his name. And that's not just then, someday, when he takes us home. That's now. I came across an interesting thing this past week. For years in New Hampshire, the license plates had a slogan, and it said, live free or die. The license plates in New Hampshire. The license plates in New Hampshire. Live free or die. And that was a line made famous by the Revolutionary War hero, General John Stark. Here's the irony. Those license plates with that message, live free or die, were made by inmates in prison. And that sort of illustrates the fact that we announce sometimes a freedom in life that we don't actually experience. And that's maybe what some of us are doing. We're trusting Jesus just to save us on the other side of the grave. So we need to hear this. Jesus came to save you from your sins now, not just from hell then, not just future but present salvation. This is not a relationship that will just help you face death. It will help you live life. A relationship which just just won't forgive you of your sins. It will deliver you from your sins. The Lord saves not just someday, this day. He was condemned so that we might live free. And Jesus always lives up to his name. Do you feel totally in bondage to a sin that's wrecking your life and your family? Have you called out to Jesus? Jesus will always live up to his name. Is your heart and emotions poisoned by anger and wounds that you can't give past? Have you, have you called out upon the name of Jesus? Jesus will always live up to his name. Do you feel far from God right now, thinking with some of the stuff I've done, I can never get close to God, even if I wanted to? Have you called upon the name of Jesus? He'll always live up to his name. I don't know about your past, but perhaps there's no one in this building this morning or watching online who has ever been guilty of murdering Christians 
And a man named Saul was. And the Lord sent a man by the name of Ananias to him. And he had been grieving for three days in repentance. And Ananias said this to him in Acts chapter 22 and verse 16. What are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, washing away your sins, calling on his name. The name of Jesus means the Lord saves. So why don't you let him do what he came to do? What are you waiting for? Let Jesus do what only he can do. He wants to live up to his name in your life today. And if you haven't placed your faith in him and been baptized into him, today's the day. At the beginning, I asked you, everyone, to say your name out loud. Maybe the best way for us to end this is for all of us on the count of three to say the name Jesus. One, two, three, Jesus. This time, let's do it again on the count of three, but let's do it a little softer. One, two, three, Jesus. One more time on the count of three, but this time softer, even more, even, even a little softer than what we just did. One, two, three, Jesus. Doesn't that sound better? Nobody, nobody makes things better than Jesus. Let's pray.